congratulations on your film, Bavarian. Thank you very much. Um, just to start off, I wanted to ask about, um, you seem to be drawing from a lot of genre tropes with sci-fi and horror, but also have mentioned that you were using ideas you explored in an earlier short film. I was yeah. wondering if you could talk about if there was a galvanizing moment that led you to create Vivarium and all its dark, sinister themes. Um, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. You can kind of go back uh, forensically, try and figure out where all the little parts came from. But, um, I mean, we made this short film called Foxes in 2011, and that was probably like a reaction to what was going on politically, uh, socio-political kind of commentary on what was happening in Ireland with the... Um, the, the the phenomenon of ghost estates, which were these kind of housing developments that ended up being abandoned, half built and <clears throat> often empty, because builders got a whole lot of uh, money from EU grants and all that kind of stuff and backhanders to build these housing developments in the middle of nowhere, and um, people were getting hundred uh, percent mortgages to buy them, and then um, they were kind of miles away from any. Uh, city, you know, they were kind of completely cut off from society and um, people had to commute on these commuter bells and they ended up kind of financially trapped in them because they couldn't sell them. And so we made that film um, <clears throat> and I think while shooting it, I, I'd seen so many of these places trying to scout and, um, and kind of immerse ourselves, even stayed in one of the houses while shooting the short film. Um, <laughs> yeah, immersive. Uh, uh, directing but um, I think there was a lot of ideas and themes sort of left over from that and then at the same time I was watching this documentary about the life cycle of the European cuckoo and I was thinking god it's, it's so it's such a strange behavior I knew about it but then just watching it just kind of um, I guess at the time we were thinking about what we wanted to do as a feature and we were also talking about Garrett and I the screenwriter um, what it is that people are afraid of these days, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we didn't want to, we want to create a new monster, but not a monster monster. Um, so, like the way Godzilla is like a manifestation of the fears around atomic energy and the atomic bomb, um, we want to make something relevant to our own time, um, and that's kind of where the the estate agent character mm -hmm. kind of ended up coming from. Um, yeah. So. I don't know, yeah, if there was a, a kind of... No, you, you kind of answered it because right. I, I was going to ask you why suburbia, because usually when we see films that are kind of these like black mirror, like yeah, things yeah, going yeah. on, it's all about technology and festering with that, but instead yeah. you've just chosen the house, which maybe you could talk more about like the surrealist elements of the film and this kind of idea of like the uncanny and like the unheimlich, which you seem to be exploring as well, if you have any influences. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I think the, the story is very um, reminiscent of like some of the older like 60s, 70s style sci-fi that were um, using sci-fi to explore socio-political ideas at the time. And um, so it, it was always, that was kind of the, the, the story we had in mind was gonna be like that. And then it probably became more and more metaphorical as we kind of stripped out um, some of the more expository dialogue and stuff like that. Um, and so it, it was, always like it's supposed to be a place that was weird <laughs> you know like when you you enter in there um it's strange at first and then it kind of becomes more evidently much stranger so it's kind of like a transition from real life into something a bit odd into mm -hmm. something where you're going this isn't like uh earth <laughs> or, yeah, you know are in you're in like a kind of parallel dimension or something um that's similar to reality but different um, and that was kind of, that was in the script, um, I think, like, there was a mention of uh, Magritte's Empire of Light in, in the script as a description. Um, and so there's always a plan to kind of have a surreal uh, aesthetic to the place. But it's obviously not a painting, it's not like a 2D flat surface, so um, the other influences are probably like, uh, Oliver Ellison's uh, weather project that was in the Tate. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see that with the big giant sun? Um, so it's kind of like an artificial environment with this fake sun, fake clouds, mm -hmm. and um, clone houses. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think because the story is so strange, 
um, it needs to be need to kind of build the world for it and then drop the characters in and the characters are quite naturalistic and real within that space you know? yeah. and how did you develop this kind of eerie sinister sense of humor throughout it was that always existed in the script or did you work with the actors to kind of no that was in the script yeah um, it was always quite kind of funny but scary at the same time um, it's kind of like a sick joke or something <laughs> Um, it's quite a bit of satire, yeah, throughout. Mm -hmm. um, but that was in script. But then, so then we played up on it, and like um, Jesse and Imogen are very funny, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so they were able to kind of bring it to life a lot as well. And same with Jonathan Harris is in his super weird, funny but strange, uncanny kind of performance. Um, and then it kind of shifts into a darker tone. I wanted to ask you a little bit as well about um, this character of Gemma mm. and um, she keeps saying throughout the, the film, I'm not your mother and she mm. wants to kind of shirk this, this maternal responsibility but yet is still assuming the role of the nurturer. So yeah. Can you talk about like, what you were trying to explore? <laughs> yeah, so she, it, it, it's, it's like a surrogacy, you know, these, these people are like a brood parasite. They're able to manipulate and get, you know, in, especially her, it's like they were selected, kind of. Like when they were in there, um, Jonathan, character, Jonathan Harris's character would have thought like, hmm, these seem like perfect, <laughs> perfect uh, samples for, uh, for the place, you know, um, as surrogates. So the little boy is able to just manipulate her enough um, for her to kind of, she, she can't help but, but be nurturing even though she keeps on rejecting it because she knows that he's not right, he's not really human and he's not her, her child, but he keeps on kind of coming up wanting her to accept him. Um, but only, he only wants that because of, uh, from a very kind of selfish point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was, it was, it's just interesting yeah, how the kid can kind of come between them and push them apart. I'm not saying that all children do that, but he's... Uh, he isn't a real child, and that's what's so kind of horrible about it. Right, because I think also uh, what you do, which is quite interesting in the film, is that you, you say that you're inspired by this parasitic cuckoo bird and the mm -hmm. way in which they infiltrate the nest. Mm -hmm. But then also the film seems to be talking about like societies, like the need to conform and obey, to yeah. all these, how we get stuck. Social so contract. Exactly. So mm -hmm. were you always thinking about navigating the natural world with our kind of like societal structures? Um, yeah, well, originally that, that scene in the opening titles wasn't, well, it was, at some point it was in the script. And then when we were kind of cutting, pairing back on things that were not really necessary, um, we ditched it from the script. Um, but then when we were finished editing, kind of wanted to, it was like, a, I quite like the idea of, explaining the entire story in the titles in a way in a kind of abstract way um, and I felt that it also helped explain the nature of the child and um, that it wasn't some sort of it wasn't out to kind of take over the world or anything like that mm -hmm. it was just in its nature so um, the plan was always to kind of show a little bit of nature at the beginning even within the school with the, the tree and the wind and all that kind of thing <clears throat> Um, because we take it away from them entirely once they get in to yonder. There's no trees, there's no grass, there's no insects, there's no wind, there's no rain, there's no anything. Mm -hmm. And I read uh, somewhere that you enjoy films or stories that are either a message or a warning. Is oh, this yeah. film a message or a warning? <laughs> yeah. What is it? <laughs> well, I guess people can take it in different ways. Uh, to me, it's more of a, a warning by amplifying um, reality in a certain way and um, you're kind of showing the absurdity of it and the, the strangeness of our own behavior and the own, our, our own kind of uh, pattern in society that we, we accept being sold this stuff um, and then kind of moving towards us um, so the little girl at the start of the, the film in the underneath the tree says you know I don't like the way things are <laughs> um, so she's sort of like a hope for the future, maybe. Mm -hmm. So it's not all bleak. No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, that's my final question. It's not all bleak in Bavaria. No. All right. Well, thank it's, you so much. You're very welcome.